The biggest danger I see is that this crowd in Washington does not understand how dangerous the situation with Russia really is. They just don't. And they continue to grossly underestimate the Russian government, its leadership, and the Russian people. You can't do that. And in the meantime, they are, they are on the bridge of the financial economic version of the Titanic. And uh, their view is uh, the iceberg that we hit back there a few kilometers ago, minor consideration, don't worry about it. And I don't think that they're going to wake, wise up until the, the waves lap over the decks and reach the bridge. Over the weekend, President Biden confirmed to Ukraine and the other G7 nations that the United States would be offering F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. How wise or dangerous is this move? Well, you, <clears throat> your viewers naturally have seen uh, the president state initially what he would not send and then subsequently backtrack down the line and say, you know, I will send it. I think that we're seeing this happen again with the uh, fourth generation aircraft, you know, the F-16. The truth of the matter is the reason he keeps backtracking is that things in Ukraine get worse. Ukrainians are losing more soldiers. Uh, their infrastructure is being destroyed. Uh, they're in, they're in very bad shape. And so under the circumstances, which you refused to send previously, you, you now send as a matter of desperation. The problem with the F-16 is twofold. First of all, I, I don't know how many people they're going to find to fly this anytime soon. Now, the, what has always concerned me and should concern Americans is the predisposition to put American pilots into those aircraft and fly them in support of the Ukrainians. Now, undoubtedly, that would be a question of calling for volunteers or bringing someone who's recently retired back to do it. The problem with that is that these are then mercenaries, and they are not covered under the Geneva Convention. In other words, they're simply fighters for hire. Uh, and that's a serious problem. What do you, what do you do if you lose one of these aircraft? And then finally, uh, I think as things get worse and they're, they're very bad now and they're only going to get worse, we're back to the temptation to find ways to intervene in Western Ukraine. As it becomes clear, this U Ukrainian state apparatus is collapsing. And remember, we own it. We, we pay for everything. We own the government. We're keeping the economy going. We're paying the troops, the, the bureaucrats, everything. So what, once that weakens, I mean, the whole thing is going to fall like a house of cards. So I, I worry that someone will say, well, let's go in, you know, with our own forces. The Russians wouldn't dare to challenge us. And, and of course, they're wrong. I think for many Russians who are extremely angry with us and the terrible damage that, that we have caused them by turning Ukraine into this platform for attack against Russia, uh, they would welcome the opportunity to crush uh, any U.S. forces that intervened, or for that matter, any NATO forces that did. So I hope hope we put that out of our minds, but I worry about that. Would that be uh, like a, a coalition of nations, or specifically like Poland, or who who do you think might make a move? And, and could they justify like Poland saying, hey, this used to be our territory anyway, we're kind of just taking it back now that Ukraine can't stand on its own two legs? Well, you know, everybody in Eastern Europe can make that assertion and uh, have some credibility. I mean, if you go to this thing they call Kaliningrad, which is uh, the very corner of East Prussia, uh, that was German from about 1220 onwards. So you're talking, what, 800, 850 years nonstop German. It's now part of Russia, thanks to FDR. Stalin, as his armies moved west, said, hey, you know, uh, we, we'd really like to have that port in the Baltic. Do you, do you have any objections? And FDR said, no, of course not, Joe, take it. You know, so now we have Russians sitting there where no one in their right mind wanted them. But uh, the, the bottom line is, sure, you can always find the Hungarians, the Poles, any numbers of people that have controlled territory that's now under somebody else's authority. So that's part of it. But I think the bigger issue is this. Whenever we go anywhere, we always go as a quote unquote coalition. We have that as the fig, le fig leaf of legitimacy. But the truth is that uh, other than the Poles, maybe some Romanians, although I have my doubts, uh, and maybe a few Brits, the United States is going to be on its own if it goes into Western Ukraine. Now, it could be some of the Lithuanians want to go along. I don't know. That could be. 
But even in Poland, the enthusiasm for this fiasco is waning. The most recent polling data says that the Poles are tired of being overwhelmed by Ukrainian refugees. They, they're openly talking about the Ukrainianization of their country, which they dislike intensely. And the Polish chief of staff has said, look, the Russians are not incompetent. They're tough soldiers. They're very competent. They know what they're doing. <clears throat> so I, I see evidence that people are sobering up. Uh, the question is, will we sober up? And I don't see any evidence for it. Just, just as you have people that absolutely refuse in Washington to believe that there, there could be a, a serious economic turndown. In other words, that there is a cost associated with money printing and uh, tightening credit and raise, rising interest rates. You can also find lots of people in Washington say, oh, you know, the Russians are nothing. We're everything. We're, we're invincible and vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's very dangerous. So I, I see that here. I don't know how deeply that runs, but, uh, you know, if you looked at some of the more recent articles that have come out, there's a lot of evidence that, uh, what I would call common sense and re reality, those things don't really intrude very much at the highest levels of the Biden administration. Yeah. Well, uh, if Europe doesn't make a move, uh, we sure know that Wall Street is going to make a move. BlackRock is already meeting with Zelensky uh -huh. and talking about how they can, uh, you know, revitalize, bring life back and yeah. how there's just so much money to be made. And I just I find it disgusting how, you know, they, they look at this as just such a great money making opportunity when there's human life on the line. Well, remember the people that you're talking about here in Washington or the, the finance financiers in Europe and the United States, uh, whether it's Soros or Larry Fink at BlackRock, they're not interested in Ukrainians. They could care less. They, they have been very hopeful that Russia could be destroyed so that they could strip Russia of its resources. Remember, you're talking about an area from sort of the middle of Ukraine all the way to uh, Kamchatka, the peninsula. That is full of extraordinary resources, everything from gold mines to uh, extraordinarily rare minerals and rare earths and uh, endless quantities of fresh water, you know, wonderful soil, uh, an abundance of food. We could go on and on and on. So I think that's really been behind much of what we see in this sort of proxy war waged against Russia. Now, I don't see any evidence that Russia is going to collapse, and, and I think Putin will probably be president long after Biden has vanished from the scene. But it's still dangerous, and uh, we'll have to see what happens to the rest of Ukraine. But you've just you've just hit on a very important point that all all the people viewing this should keep in mind. If you're a Russian right now and you look at the situation, you've taken, contrary to what the mainstream media says, comparatively few casualties. I mean, you have an exchange rate of about one Russian killed for every seven Ukrainians killed. So that that's a pretty favorable ratio. Nobody likes to lose anybody in war, but that's a good position to be in. Just as Ukraine is now scraping the bottom of the barrel, running out of manpower, they're actually dragging back about thirty to 35,000 Ukrainians training in Germany, Canada, the United States, the Czech Republic, other places back to Ukraine to become the foundation for this so-called counteroffensive that they want to, uh, you know, execute. And the rest of them, though, unfortunately, are just being uh, hang shanghaied into the, into the military. You know, you talk about a lot of young boys, a lot of old men, and so forth. Russia's in a different position. Russia's stronger than ever. Russia is actually peaking in its capability. If you look at its forces... They've, they've really learned a great deal over the last year plus. In other words, if we look at the initial uh, Russian forces that went in, like any army that has not seen action for a very long time, uh, they made mistakes. But they learned from those mistakes. And there's a great report out from the Re Royal United Services Institute. It, it still has stupid things in it about the Russians lacking initiative and all that, but Brush that aside and just look at what they talk about in terms of adaptation and innovation. <clears throat> and you see that the Russians have really produced a very, very fine force. And they're better now than they've ever been. And they're larger now than they've ever been. And they have more modern equipment, more experience. So when, when they are finally released and allowed to execute, uh, and I think they're waiting for the Ukrainians to expel, you know, sort of exhaust the last 
forces at their disposal on another pointless counterattack. Once, once that happens, you know, they're in the driver's seat. So why would they sit idly by and allow us to intervene or even worse, bother negotiate with us? You know, the Politico article that came out over the weekend said that <clears throat> behind the scenes in Washington, the Biden administration, White House, State Department, people are, are now talking about a frozen conflict as the best outcome. And think about that. This, these are people in Washington who want to turn Ukraine into Korea, create a DMZ. And of course, then they want to park their forces in Western Ukraine on the other side of the Dnieper River, staring at the, at the Russians. Or better yet, if the Russians would accept such a thing, they'll, they'll cross the river up in Northern Ukraine and sit there. Russians will never accept that. It's out of the question. They have been fighting to demilitarize Ukraine, eliminate the armed forces there that threaten them. And then secondly, they want this place to be neutral. So the idea that they, that these people at the top could look forward to some sort of uh, Korea like division of Ukraine and that they might be satisfied with that is, is a manifestation of how utterly uninformed and ridiculous they are. I mean, it just makes no sense. They're, they're not listening to the Russians. They're not acknowledging reality. Well, they're they're still trying to push this narrative that this was an unprovoked attack versus uh, a decade of building up and provoking Putin to the point where he felt like my only option is to create this buffer zone. Uh, and unfortunately, Ukraine uh, has, you know, has to become that that buffer zone. Um, let, let's move on to uh, Bakhmut for a minute. Um Russia says Bakhmut has fallen. Uh, Zelensky says, no, it hasn't. We still have soldiers in the area fighting. And until we run out of bodies, uh, this area is not taking, uh, taken. Um, how does the, the, the battle for Bakhmut <clears throat> show, uh, how military strategies and goals can change over time? And in your opinion, uh, has Bakhmut fallen into the hands of Russia? Well, Bakhmut, 90% of it has been in Russian hands now for months. It's only this small sliver of land on the very edge that remained in uh, Ukrainian hands. And they occupied some concrete reinforced buildings, very large sort of high-rise like buildings. And the Russians were very reluctant to destroy them because they had information that there were Russian civilians in the basements. We have to understand that you're operating in a part of Ukraine where the population is really Russian. Now, they may have been Ukrainian citizens, but of course, Ukrainians treated them badly, didn't allow them to speak their language, have their schools, worship as they saw fit.